Today, I'm going to talk to you about um, some OIF projects, uh, particularly building blocks for 800G co-packaged optics and beyond. Um, I'm not as eloquent or as organized, and I don't have the marketing team that some of the others do. My slides are a little too wordy, but we're going to do my best. So the OIF um, is an international consortium since 1998, it brought together industry groups from data and telecom worlds. Initially, it was that marriage between the two groups. Um, it's evolved since then. We do a lot more things, and I will expand on that. With a simple mission, foster development and deployment of interoperable products and um, you know, accelerate uh, uh, introduction into the marketplace. We have over 100 members, and they truly um, comprise the whole ecosystem from network operators down to um, postdoc um, startups, you know, with an uh, interesting looking component. Um, enough of an introduction. For an outline, I'm going to talk about our common electrical I.O., or otherwise known as CEI. We have a long history there. We are currently uh, wrapping up 112G and moving on to 224. And my tagline, we can't really get started on a lot of these things without this electrical base. For co-packaged optics, uh, definitely a topic of interest. Um, with any luck, you saw my uh, coworker, uh, Jeff Hutchins, talk about this uh, recently in that workshop. Um, there are so many options. And our goal right at the moment is let's get together in this pre-competitive environment and agree on as many things as possible. And simply for the 800G coherent, well, let's build on our success on 400ZR. Um, fancy logo. Um, some people don't necessarily know the history, and so I do like to show a slide like this. It's not exactly a roadmap. Uh, quite often, uh, we write the roadmap after we've gotten there to sort of show what path we took. This is sort of giving that indication on the amount of electrical work. And prior to that, some uh, protocol work um, strictly on electrical interfaces. Right at the moment, we are working on the 112G. Um, I will I want to make one more point before I move off of this one. Um, that last uh, column is really talking about the impact that um, CEI has had. I'm not saying that it's a cut and paste effort for all of these groups, but this does create uh, much of the um, foundation for those efforts. Um, moving on, uh, this is what we currently have ongoing in this 112G space. Um, essentially, it's broken up um, by distance, but keep in mind, there are also different other requirements, whether it's latency, whether it's power. Um, that's an additional reason why there are um, so many different projects for somewhat similar uh, applications. But specifically, we are breaking it up into this multi-chip module, everything on a single, um, single stack, so to speak. Um, the XSR is up to a two inch package or 50 millimeters. Um, again, sort of targeting that uh, um, integrated um, module. Uh, VSR has been a definition for quite a while. That is your um, um, chip on a um, motherboard, so to speak, to a pluggable optics module. Uh, MR and LR being more backplane oriented. Um, let's see. PAM4 entered the environment at 56G. What we see is it becomes dominant 
in our 112G work. Um, okay, I've touched on these. So again, all three topics are very current. Um, this 224G project started in August. There was a recommend, uh, recognition among the membership that, uh, hey, there's, there's some additional complexity that will perhaps require additional time. And so rather than start those individual projects for each reach, you know, we are projecting a little bit more what those applications will be. And so there's quite a bit of effort here at the beginning to actually reassess those reaches, reassess those requirements, trying to determine, okay, now how do we uh, divide and conquer this application space? So this is, this is ongoing now. Um, in our quarterly meetings with uh, various interim uh, telecoms that uh, we're, we're work currently working on this debate analysis. And here's some examples, you know, looking at what the trade-offs are and modulation, you know, how many levels of modulation we're looking at. Um, you see, uh, this is an example of the type of contribution, the type of presentation that we use as a basis for our discussions. Um, in addition, you know, looking at what the reaches are, um, it, again, historically, what have been the changes, the impact sort of going forward as we extend to um, higher rates and long, or in, in different reaches more so the higher rates. Um, again, back to requirements, looking at what those equipment architectures are, in which cases can we use a retimer, in which cases are we, you know, can we not? Um, again, these are significant um, um, discussions that we have the benefit of uh, Surtees vendors in the room uh, talking to um, talking to equipment manufacturers, as well as having that oversight from network operators. And clearly, last but not least, uh, they do tend to drive the bus. We have uh, connector vendors talking about you know what these channels are going to look like. You know how do we you know close that link budget uh, with these different available technologies. That sort of touches on our 224 gigabit work. Um, again, all three of these major topics um, are very current and very active. Um, we, we welcome additional participation. Um, okay, enough on electrical work. Ah, co-packaging. Um, I respect that uh, there are other much more expert in this technology, but I do want to, you know, talk from the standardization point of view. Um, what is our approach? Because it's a wild and woolly world. Um, there are a lot of uh, differentiation uh, being uh, projected in the marketplace. So what can we do to sort of place some amount of organization onto that. You know, I, I talk about these objectives, but that middle bullet is really the main one. We have started just this last month, this framework project. Um, if you look back to 2010, the OIF had this 100G framework or umbrella project. And that was, the, the output was a simple white paper but that simple white paper identified a single modulation format. And that became the real basis for 100G coherent uh, transmissions. Um, it sounds like uh, perhaps a, a bragging type of statement, but that actually did make a significant difference because once you sort of get everyone to line up 
behind that modulation format, then there's a recognition, there's a marketplace for those individual co coherent components. Um, that is the plan for this uh, standardization effort in co-packaging. Which things can we try to identify that we can get consensus on at this early stage that perhaps eases the um, lining up of people behind specific uh, applications and solutions without you know, eliminating the uh, technical advantage or differentiation in the marketplace. Um, again, uh, we have many objectives, which I'm gonna talk about um, in future slides, but the goal is this framework project uh, meant to sort of give that overview with specifying some specific, um, um, yeah, specifying some specific items that we can come to consensus on. I'll go through these slides somewhat quicker because again, with any luck, people that are most interested have heard them spoken to by a, a much more knowledgeable person um, in this uh, technology. Um, again, starting again, why do we need this organization? There are so many applications. You know, the applications have significantly different requirements. You know, looking at low latency, to uh, perhaps power consumption, you know, clearly all these things are important to everyone, but there are trade-offs made and those trade-offs become those different application spaces. Um, can't say it will end up similar to CEI where we are able to make so many different bins, but identifying those bins is an important uh, uh, early step. Impacts of technology differences. Um, again, uh, this is sort of showing motherhood and apple pie, different approaches to, to how you build your multi-chip module or, or whatever architecture you are using, whether it's stacked, whether it's side by side, whether it's multiple things on an individual substrate. We have, we have a number of different options. Um, in the past, we've looked at things like at least defining this mechanical envelope, uh, determining where the I.O. are, determining uh, pinouts and pitch and things like that. Those are the type of individual things that we're at least trying to start with. Impacts of these differences, you know, clearly things like uh, um, the, the thermal management. You know, which, where is the heat going? Uh, what's that height gonna be? Again, if it's something as simple as establishing the height for, for this co-packaged optic, you know, package, that becomes a standard height that multiple uh, vendors can use for planning this thermal management. Uh, different connector variants. You know, where do we need connectors? Are we going to use onboard or midboard connectors? Um, are we going to use, uh, is it all going to be uh, silicon photonics? So we need an external laser. Uh, will there be any opportunities for indium phosphide where we have perhaps laser or, or indium phosphide on silicon where we have that type of integration? Um, many different connector aspects to consider. And even more things, you know, I touched on thermal interface, but, you know, the environment, you know, what type of requirements are we going to have there? Again, that goes to application spaces. What type of reliability standards are we looking for? Um, management interface, I'm going to stomp my foot on that again later. But as we see in the component world, um, <laughs> equipment vendors absolutely don't like you know, the, the proliferation of different management interfaces. Um, software is, is uh, perhaps overwhelming um, in certain areas. Um, so 
Um, again, this is a new project start, but there was some assessment by Jeff Hutchins of Ran of Us again, uh, looking at uh, which are the low hanging fruit, which of these things can we try to assess? And we've got them ranked from challenge, most challenging to easy. And again, this is giving you an idea of what those priorities might be for this, for this project. Moving on, my last big topic is 800G coherent. Again, OIF sort of placed their flag in the coherent transmission um, space back in 2010 with that 100G framework. We have expanded on that with things like the uh, CFP2 ACO, which was uh, um, an optimal solution for that particular window in time. Um, most recently, I'm going to stop there because that's what these slides say, and some of them actually have pictures. Um, stomping my foot again, OAF, how OAF accelerated 100G. It was using existing standards, working with other standards bodies. So that sort of points to, hey, those links on both sides are going to be 100 gigabit Ethernet, and the link in the middle will be, you know, OTU4, but how do we come to some consensus so we don't have every equipment vendor have a proprietary solution? That was the indication, or that was the biggest criticism of the 40G deployment. With this 100G deployment, you know, we were able in this framework document to establish this clear business case, not just for, um, network operators, but primarily for component vendors. Uh, if you know this is a there's this clear business case and you have people lining up, it is much easier to spend those development dollars. Um, that's what created the strong ecosystem. And then we started working on the pieces, you know, drawing blocks around what the photonic uh, transmit um, uh, components would be. How do I get them all into that same box? Uh, similarly with the photonic receiver, you know, the integrated coherent receiver became one of the components that, uh, again, we have a number of different vendors for today. Um, this sort of repeats things that I said. Uh, I'll stomp my foot again on tunable lasers. We came out with the initial tunable laser standard back in 2003. And so we have been in this tunable laser space. We have identified management interface. We've done multiple different form factors as integration and density uh, push that size. Um, these are the higher dollar items. So there are cost savings for the industry. And these are essentially those three main components, which took us to last year's project, this integrated coherent transmit received optical subassembly. What I have pictures are is a type one on the left. It's all silicon photonics with an external laser. We have our type two on the right with the uh, um, in the, with, with the internal uh, indium phosphide laser. Um, this combines all those functions into an individual package. And again, we don't say that these are built for um, a specific module form factor, but clearly that was taken into consideration, you know, such that, oh, it can't be taller than this in order to fit into this type of module. I'll touch on 400ZR. You just heard Joseph's presentation. There's not too much more I can say. Uh, this document was published in March of this year. Um, sadly, the giant uh, um, demos we had for OFC um, didn't come to fruition, but we still published it and the uh, industry went on. Uh, we currently have a maintenance effort to reduce the spacing from 100 gigahertz to 75 gigahertz spacing. Um, and as you, as again, Joseph said, there have been many interop announcements. Uh, initially, module to module, uh, different module vendors, but it's using the same DSP. And now much more recently, um, 
module to module interoperability using different DSPs. I mean, clearly that was the goal. It's still good to see these actual demonstrations happen. I will touch on a couple more things before I really say 800G again, this coherent common management interface system. So CMIS was created sort of as a common uh, MIS for multiple form factors, QSFP, DD, OSFP, and COBO in particular. Um, the catch is because of that application space for those modules, it, there really wasn't a portion dedicated to, oh, what if it's a coherent signal? What if we have DWDM fun functions? So the OAF sort of took that ball, ran with it, um, created this effort, uh, actually, you know, um, started a new group within the OIF that meets weekly on this, where management interface was somewhat of a um, secondary thought prior to this. This group now, again, meets weekly. The initial implementation was for 400 ZR, but now we have reached out to the industry and we're looking at what the future of management interfaces will look like. Um, oh, we, we have about a minute. Okay, I, I'm almost there, sorry. Um, again, these slides will be available. You can look at them. Essentially, everyone agrees that something new needs to be done, but they'd really like to see some examples before they line up behind it. And clearly they would always like everything to be backwards compatible. Last but not least, 800G coherent project started just this last month. Uh, similar goals to 400ZR, but we didn't want to call it 800ZR. Um, we're just sticking with 800G coherent, um, single Lambda for DWDM systems, uh, supporting ethernet clients. We are not trying to define an 800 gigabit ethernet. I want to stomp my foot and say that, that is not our space but we will show how we can support you know, 100 and 400 gigabit clients there. Um, again, line side interoperability and optical specifications will be the uh, main topics there. Uh, that sort of summarizes everything with any luck. I sort of poked on my bullets and that's what you'll take away from this discussion. And last but not least, we are a member driven contribution based organization collaborating with other standard bodies to promote interoperability and accelerate the adoption of optical network technologies. Thank you all for your time. Hey, thank you, Carl. Appreciate it. Great talk. Um, I've got one, one question here, one quick question. Um, and I think you touched on it a little bit, but I'll just like a quick answer because we're running a little late. It says, what's the OIF stance and plans on OBO, onboard optics, um, and the pluggable to CPO co-packaging transition, will this happen without passing through onboard optics? Just a quick answer here, because I know we're short on time. Tough, tough one, because I, there's I, a, lot I of, a lot of options. Yeah. I, 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 really can't, I really can't predict that. I wouldn't try. That's okay. Let's this see. Is... And, and I can see a second question. I think I can ask that, answer that really quick. Um, again, we didn't try to call it 400 or 800 ZR. Um, ZR is sort of a marketing term that we jumped on, you know, some old ethernet term um, that hasn't necessarily been defined by IEEE. So we're not necessarily saying ZR this time because we are looking at those two different reaches with one being significantly shorter but we don't want to say those reachers are 800 ZR and 800 LR, but those are sort of the targets we're looking at. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Carl. Thank you.